All right, good evening from this historic place in uh, the outskirts of Nairobi in Kenya, which has been my home for the last 15 years. Um, uh, some of you may already recognize this place. Um, some of you may have seen this place not once, but actually many times. I'll give you a glimpse of it. Uh, and you may ask yourself, where do I know this place from? Let me, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, solve this riddle for you. Some of you may know it anyway. This is the fireplace that uh, 36 years ago, uh, Robert Radford and Meryl Streep sent in front of, and Meryl Streep told stories to Robert Radford in the movie Out of Africa in front of this fireplace. This is um, in, a, in a historic house uh, built in 1910, um, which uh, has been the set of the movie Out of Africa, and which is the place where I've been living the last 15 years. And this is uh, a quite appropriate, I believe, uh, backdrop to this uh, session today on the migration in East Africa. Um, welcome to this uh, journey through East Africa. And uh, I am thrilled to have you uh, um, part of this uh, uh, session today. Let me briefly introduce my, myself. My name is Florian Keller. I um, I'm one of the founders of Enchanting Travel. Um, I started the company 15 years ago to the, together with my uh, two partners and uh, built the African part of the business and 15 years ago moved uh, to, to Kenya and to, to make a dream come true to live in Africa. And that dream is still uh, an ongoing dream and every day I'm, uh, I'm grateful for being able to be here. And now I'm excited to share, um, you know, my dream with you and, and this wonderful part of the world with you. Uh, many of you uh, will probably know Enchanting Travels, but uh, for those of you who do not know us, let me briefly introduce who we are. Enchanting Travel is really all about tailor-made travel, about making your or our guests' travel dreams come true. We uh, spend time listening to our guests, understanding what your travel dreams are and everyone's travel dreams is slightly different. And then our travel consultants, uh, many of which sit in the destinations have been traveling extensively in the destinations, match what they understand, what your dreams are with, uh, you know, the experience on the ground. And, you know, this is how a tailor-made journey is uh, coming to life. Uh, we have a team on the ground in all our destinations here in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, uh, in Oceania, of course, in the U.S. as well. Uh, and for our guests, this really means, um, you know, unusual personal, uh, you know, raw travel experiences with, you know, still um, a smooth, uh, perfect organization. So uh, let me um, just say, where can you travel with us? Uh, we started our humble beginnings, I think 16 years ago, we're actually in India. We started as Enchanting India in 2004. So that's the cradle, and then we expanded to Africa, expanded to Latin America, and uh, over the last couple of years, we, we expanded our footprint uh, globally. Now you can travel to all continents of the world with us. And before I actually start uh, this journey to East Africa, I'd love to understand um, where would you like to travel right now? Many of you um, have probably been at home uh, for the last year, year and a half, and waiting to be able to go out and travel again. So I'd just love to get a sense of where uh, does it, uh, you know, in, where in the world would you love to go right now? So just take a moment to give you a, 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 an opportunity to share. Yeah, well, not surprisingly, Africa is in the lead. There's also a question of when do you want to, when do you envision to travel? And, um, I see, but well, let me not influence your rating. Um, I'll, I'll share with you what I see here in a moment, but I'll give you a moment. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, many of you, of course, not surprisingly, since this is a session about Africa, uh, uh, more than two thirds of you uh, would love to have Africa on your, on your bucket list, but there's also a good number of Latin America, Europe, uh, Oceania, Asia, and then most of you, about again, two thirds, are uh, planning to travel in, in 2022. Some of you are just dreaming, some of you are actually uh, already planning to, to travel this year. That's great to know. So um, our journey today takes us to East Africa, to the great migration in Kenya and Tanzania. 
And again, before I actually start, I'd love to know uh, who of you actually has already been to Africa? Have you been there? Uh, not yet. Have you been once or twice or even more times? And have you seen the Great Migration? I just give you a moment to, to share. And it's helpful for me to get a sense of uh, many of you here have experienced what I'm going to be talking about, or uh, is it for most of you uh, something new? Let me see. I'll just give you another moment. Great. So I see, oh, wow. So there's um, uh, about just under uh, about a third have been to Africa once or twice, about 20%, three or more times, and almost half, just under half, not yet. So that's great. I, I look forward to introducing you then to Africa. And uh, about 80% or 20% have seen the migration, 80% haven't. So uh, that's that's good to know that um, for many of you, what I'm talking about today is new. Some of you will have experienced what I'm sharing uh, with you. Um, what I want to share with you is give you a glimpse of what is the migration. Why is it? Why you know? Why is it a migration? Why do why do the animals move? Uh, where do they move? And what are the different experiences at the different places where you can see them? Uh, and what might be the best place to see them. Uh, I also want to uh, share with you and bring to life the possible migration experiences that you can have. What kind of safari experiences are there that you can uh, uh, experience, enjoy, um, and also give you a glimpse of what are the kind of accommodation on safari. There are different types of accommodation that I want to bring to life and share with you. And then lastly, um, if you go all the way out to East Africa and to see the migration, where else might you go and where else might you combine uh, a visit to the migration? So that's what I want to cover today. Um, there is a chat um, uh, window here. So if you want to ask questions, please do so at any time. Uh, there will be time at the end to address your questions. Um, and uh, we'll also have, as you've already seen, one or two more polls over the course of this, just for us, for me to get a sense of, um, uh, you know, uh, where, where's your mind in terms of travel right now. Anyway, let me start uh, with a great migration uh, in the uh, in East Africa. And you see here a map of East Africa. You see Tanzania here and Kenya. And this is really a map of the migration. And it is the migration um, uh, uh, combines the Serengeti National Park in the Serengeti in Tanzania with the Maasai Mara National Reserve in Kenya. It's an ever uh, flowing cycle. The reason why it's there is that. There's about a million and a half wildebeest and half a million zebra. Nobody really knows how many, but roughly that, about two million animals. And they are moving in huge herds. And, and, and because there are so many of them, wherever they go, they eat the grass. And at some point, they have to move on. And that's really the reason why they migrate, just in ever, uh, you know, constant search of grass. And you can roughly um, uh, predict where they will be when. It starts at the beginning of the year in January, um, until about March, you, will, you can expect to find them in the southern Serengeti. Um, that's where the hundreds of thousands of young ones are born. That's a very dramatic time because you can imagine where there's uh, so many young, uh, you know, uh, um, vulnerable kids. There's a lot of predators vying for them. So it's very dramatic and not always pretty, quite frankly, but it's dramatic at, at minimum, you can say. Then the animals move into the central Serengeti, uh, where you will find them in April, May, uh, and they continue into the western Serengeti, uh, May to June, and then they reach the northern Serengeti, and they will cross back and forth between the northern Serengeti and the Masai Mara in Kenya between July and September, October, until uh, sometime in October, November, they make their way further uh, south again towards the southern Serengeti. So November, December, you can expect to find them somewhere uh, uh, in between the north and the south. And you can never exactly predict where they are. And the reason for that is uh, that it's very much determined by the rains. If there's a lot of rain, there's a lot of fresh grass and the animals stay longer. If, there, if, if it's a dry year, if there's little rain, then they will eat the grass. There's no new grass coming, so they will move on faster. So you can only directionally predict where they are. Uh, and if you want to you know, uh, make sure that you see them, then somewhere in those time windows, uh, you, you have good chances to see them. But you have to know uh, uh, when to be where to have a good chance of seeing them. So this is the, the migration. This is a, a great image of the migration. It brings the dynamic 
a life of the migration, this energy of thousands of animals moving and moving and moving. Uh, I live in Kenya. I've been fortunate to see the migration uh, pretty much every year in the last 15 years. It's about a, a five hour drive from, from Nairobi into the Maasai Mara. So between July and, and, and September, October, I can, uh, we can see it here. This is last year. Last year was a unique year to see the migration because you could see the migration with no one else around. For those of you who've seen it in the Maasai Mara, you will know there's a lot of other travelers. Last year, there was no one there because there, no one traveled, of course, as you know. Uh, the, in fact, the, the, the Nairobi airport was closed. No one could come in. So there are only a few local residents who would go to the Maasai Mara. This year looks like it might be like this. So if you have planned to travel uh, this year, um, this is going to be a, a, an awesome experience because last year was extreme where, where normally you would see crossings over the Mara River and there might be 50 or 100 vehicles. There were one or two last year. Um, this year it will be somewhere, probably more, but, but not as many as, as normally. And uh, so you will see the migration. You will see the Serengeti Masai Mara as you probably wouldn't have seen them in 20, 30 years. So that's um, a little bit of a backdrop. Let us start the journey and follow the migration. Uh, starting at the beginning of, of the year in January, February, March, as I said, this is uh, in the Southern Serengeti um, when uh, hundreds of thousands of young ones are born. The reason why they're bo born there is that um, you have these endless uh, grass savannas. Uh, here you have a glimpse of them, you know, as far as the eye can see, you see these little dots there. That's all uh, uh, wildebeest and zebra. And you have these little uh, um, um, island mountains sticking out of the savanna, but you have huge savannas, a lot of grass. That's why they spend quite a long time, they're about three months until they uh, move on. The Southern Serengeti is very seasonal in the time uh, uh, late December until February, it's very green. The rains in East Africa are typically in November, December, and then in April, May. So after the rains in January, February, it's very green, very lush. You have seasonal lakes, but then when it gets dry, uh, uh, dry the Southern Serengeti is extremely dry. So don't go there in you know July, August, September, uh, October. You will hardly see any wildlife there because it's it's just dry. It's just, you can hardly see any grass there. Uh, but uh, in season, January, February, March, it is beautiful. Uh, let us follow the migration. They are now moving into the central Serengeti. Uh, this is a, an area that is all year round lush and green because there's uh, permanent water in the central Serengeti. There are little streams and, and therefore you have, this is an area where you can see wildlife all year round different to the southern Serengeti. It's particularly famous for the leopards. You know, the leopards often rest in the trees and, and you see them often coming down. Uh, so that's a particularly uh, particular attraction all year round in the Serengeti. Uh, another attraction in the central Serengeti are these copias, these Inselbergs Island uh, mountains, these striking granite copias just rising out of the savanna. <clears throat> and you might be tempted to actually climb them because you'd have a beautiful viewpoint from there. Uh, just be careful doing so because uh, the lions think the same. They, they, they also uh, uh, like these, these copias. They often climb up and, and use them as a natural vantage point. So you often see lions on top of, those, uh, of these granite rocks. Um, the migration then moves on uh, into the Western Serengeti. Um, again, in season, uh, very lush and green, very diverse landscapes. And this is where the first time the migrating animals um, uh, come across a natural barrier, and it's the Grumeti River. And this is where you see these striking scenes of hundreds or thousands of wildebeest, you know, throwing themselves into the uh, Grumeti River where you have huge crocodiles waiting for them. There's another one, uh, the Mara River, which is a bit more known, and we'll talk about this in a moment, but it's quite similar, uh, the experience. Uh, the migratory animals then move on into the northern Serengeti. Again, you have quite open, lush plains with a lot of grass. That's why they spent quite a lot of time in the northern Serengeti, um, about three months, because there's enough food for them. And often you drive through these herds, and they, you know, of course, they part in front of your car. But you know, I would like to share with you a video. It's just over Zoom. It's a bit tricky to show videos, but you will hear like a mind-blowing 
uh, concert of uh, 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 just around you, out of all angles, you have the wildebeest making these sounds, probably complaining that you're driving through there. Um, but it's, it's, an, it's a mind blowing experience to, to experience that. And of course, then they will uh, reach this second barrier, which is now the Mara River, which is a little bit bigger than the, than the Grumeti River. And what often happens is you see those crossings here, but it often takes hours until this actually happens. You, you might come to the river, um, see a herd of wildebeest there, maybe hundreds or even thousands, and you think, oh, they will be crossing in a moment. But then nothing happens. So what often happens is they will run towards the river. As they approach the river, the, the ones in the front will see these huge Nile crocodiles, and they will come to a stop. The ones in the back push, the ones in the front want to go back, and they often move sidewards, sidewards again. And you can see it's very inter interesting psychologically. It's almost like a, a crowd of humans, you know, where you see those crowd dynam dynamics. No one really wants to be the first to cross. But then if one of them, only one of them jumps into the river, there is no back, no turning back. At that point, everyone just follows. That only one has to jump and then everyone follows and then um, no crocodile stands in their way. Uh, they will just uh, pass through and you see them often jump down these steep riverbanks and then they will meet these huge crocodiles in the river. <clears throat> and the crocodiles actually kill the wildebeest by drowning them. So what they have to do, they have to go into the center of the, the river where it's deep and then they pull them down. And you, if, you're, if you're on the riverbank watching them, you will inevitably find yourself uh, you know, cheering for one of them. I think most of us will probably cheer for the wildebeest. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll see this, 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 uh, this, you know, huge crowd of wildebeest crossing, and then might, you might see a, a huge crocodile very slowly approaching. And they know they don't have to be in a hurry. You know, you, they know this is going to last for a long time. So they very slowly move, and you, you find yourself you know, really, you know, being on the edge and wondering what's going to happen next. And eventually you will see these kind of scenes. And then sometimes the wildebeest will struggle free and escape. Sometimes they'll be pushed under the water, pulled under the water, and they struggle back up, try to, to breathe, and then they'll be pulled down again. It's very dramatic. It's not for everyone, but that's really just raw nature. And there's very few um, situations where you, where you can experience this, um, this kind of you know, wildlife experience. And you, so you have a front seat. This year you'll have a front seat with a lot fewer people than in normal years. Um, this is one side of the migration, but you also have these uh, idyllic side of the migration. This is the Maasai Mara. The Maasai Mara is on one side, it, it borders the Serengeti. So you have, you actually see that here. This is looking south uh, from one of the escarpments surrounding the Maasai Mara. And you see here in the distance, that's actually the Serengeti Plains. But on three sides, the Mara is uh, framed by high escarpments. They might be five, 600 meters high. And you have incredible, incredible views from up there. You see here down there, the Mara River, just uh, you know, meandering through. Uh, and you have incredible views. That's one of the beautiful uh, sides of the, the Mara in particular, that you have these uh, beautiful viewpoints. And of course, especially towards the end of the day, you often have them spectacular sundowners and, and uh, I remember one of the first experiences that I had um, in the Maasai Mara was uh, the first time or the second time there, we were in a small safari camp, uh, just slightly outside the reserve where you could walk. Um, and and the, the manager told us, why don't you walk up to the hill, um, you know, uh, for a sundowner up there or just an afternoon walk up there. And we said, fine, we'll do this. We walked up and, you know, after an hour and a half, um, the sun was now starting to get really low. We asked our guide, you know, shouldn't we turn around? Uh, we've been walking for an hour and a half. It looks like the sun is going to go down soon. Uh, we were getting a little bit concerned. The guide said, no, no, don't worry. We'll figure, we'll, 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 you're, you're fine. We'll sort it out. We didn't know what was going to happen. We came to the top of that hill. The top of the hill, they had uh, a setting like this, you know, some safari chairs, a little bar, you know, with our favorite drinks that asked us what drinks. And then we had this, um, amphitheater in front of us with, you know, the entire Maasai Mara and then in the distance, the Serengeti Plains and the sun setting like a golden ball right in front of us. I think that was 
one of the moments when I fell in Africa, I fell in love with Africa and, and just felt, you know, this is a place where I would like to live. And it took a few more years for me to actually, uh, you know, gather the, the courage to do it. And eventually I did. And uh, 15 years later, I'm grateful every day to be able to, to live here. So this is um, a glimpse, an overview of the different parts of the Serengeti and the Masai Mara. You may ask yourself, now, where should I go? What, what are the pros and cons of, of the Serengeti, the Masai Mara, different parts? So let me help you with this. Where to go, Serengeti or Masai Mara? Um, Serengeti has some clear advantages. You can see the migration all year round. Uh, you just need to know where to go uh, when. Different parts of the year, uh, the migration is in different parts uh, of the Serengeti. If you're in the Southern Serengeti in July, August, when the migration to the Northern Serengeti, you're not gonna see it. It's gonna be a 10, 12 hour drive on a rough road. You will not see it. So you have to know where the migration is when. Um, one advantage of the Serengeti is it, it has much fewer lodges than the Masai Mara. You may remember the map that I showed you. It showed a relatively small Masai Mara and a big Serengeti. Serengeti is about five, six times bigger than the Masai Mara, but the Masai Mara has about double or even triple the number of hotel rooms or lodge rooms than the, the Serengeti. So that means uh, um, relative to its size, there's a lot fewer people, uh, visitors in the Serengeti. So you have a slightly more exclusive experience than the Masai Mara. On the, on the flip side, um, you have less diversity in terms of experience. Because it's a national park, uh, you, you can't really only do game drives there. Um, there. There are only very few places, private concession areas, where you can do walking safaris or night game drives. So it's really game drives uh, every day, uh, which is exciting. But especially for those of you who might just love walking and be close to nature, uh, the Serengeti has limited opportunities for that. Uh, also, if you're interested in getting a glimpse of everyday life, you won't be able to do that in the Serengeti because it's a national park. So no one is living there. So it's basically just all focused on nature and animals, which is the main draw. But if you wanted to get a glimpse of life, you won't be able to do it. The Masai Mara, on the other hand, um, you will see the migration, but between July and September, sometimes into October. Uh, but what is really important to highlight is there is amazing wildlife all year round in, this, in the Masai Mara. Even if the migration is not there, you will see the big five, you will see big herds of, um, you know, uh, planes game all year round, huge herds of elephants. Uh, so the Masai Mara never, never disappoints. I think in the last 18 years that I've lived in East Africa now, I must have been in the Masai Mara 30, 40 times, and, and it's always been mind blowing. Yeah? Um, one of the things that might be a great option is to actually um, stay in the surrounding private conservancies, and I'll talk about this in a moment, which offer very exclusive and diverse experiences. All of the things you can't actually do in the Masai Mara, you can do walking safaris, night game drives, uh, off-road driving, and, and get glimpses of everyday life. So let me give you a bit more of a glimpse of what the Masai Mara looks like, because the Masai Mara is not really just a homogenous experience. You, you can choose where to be. So you see here a map, you see the border between Tanzania and Kenya, the Serengeti on the southern side of it, the Masai Mara on the Kenyan northern side of it, and it's a national reserve. So you can either choose to be inside the Masai Mara reserve or in one of the private uh, conservancies around the Masai Mara. And the experience is quite different. And I want to explain the difference in the experience because it, uh, uh, it really um, uh, changes how you experience it. The Masai Mara, uh, it's really the place where you can see the river crossings. You see the Mara River uh, coming here from the north uh, in the Mara North Conservancy and then flowing into the reserve, meandering through eventually flowing into the Serengeti where you can also see the crossings. Now, the crossings you only see in the reserve. For some reason, the, the migrating animals don't go into the conservancies. And I think the reason might be that there is humans living there, so they shy away uh, from that. So the, the actual migrating crossings you only see in the National Reserve. Uh, the near, on the other hand, the National Reserve is busier. You have lots of lodges there. You also have day visitors there and your limit because it's a National Reserve. You can't do walking safaris except in one or a few, uh, two places which have special concessions. You can't do night game drives. There's no off-road driving and, and there's no one living there. So you don't really have any authentic cultural encounters. Uh, if you stay in the camps inside the reserve. 
if you stay in one of the private conservancies, um, you will not see the, the, the crossing over the Mara River because they don't cross in the conservancies, but it's a very exclusive experience. You don't have day visitors allowed there. <coughs> you have um, uh, regulation if there's a, a special wildlife sighting, like a, 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 a cat, a lion, a leopard, they only allow five vehicles per sighting. So you never have these crowds of vehicles around the animals there. Uh, we have very diversified experience. Uh, you can do the things that you can't do in the Serengeti or in the National Reserve. You can do walking safaris, night game drives, off-road driving, and you can do uh, uh, experience, uh, you know, cultural encounters. Uh, many of the camps have the majority of the staff coming from local villages. So the camps are actually a major driver of employment in this area. And then it's very easy to just go with your guide who might just come from the nearest village and he will take you to his village and you get a glimpse of what life is like. The best time in my mind is you can either go in the morning if you want to see a school and uh, uh, maybe you know tell a story uh, to the kids. Uh, another great time is the late afternoon when you know the, the, the animals come back into the village and the village comes to life and you can just stand there and observe what is happening and it's like you're invisible no one will actually see you're there they won't try to sell you something they won't try to dance for you it's just you observe life and I personally really enjoy that the, the guide might then explain you know you know introduce you to his family might have a tea in his in his hut and then you just leave again and you get a glimpse of what life is like and uh, in my mind actually staying in one of these private conservancies is kind of best of both worlds because you have the exclusive experience, the diversifying experiences, if you want to cultural encounters in the concession, the private conservancy, and you can still do day trips into the National Reserve. So my personal favorite is actually that because you have all the advantages of, of both um, the exclusivity, the diversity, and the, the, the crossings if you want it during the migration season. So that's just a little bit of, of background for those of you who are interested in going and you wonder when should I go, where should I go? Of course, you can reach out to us and we can share that with you in more detail, but that might be helpful for you to, to take some decisions. So we talked about the different parts of the Serengeti, the different parts of the Maasai Mara. Let me talk about the different experiences on safari. Uh, what, how can you actually go on safari? Um, most of you have not been on safari, so that might be interesting of you for you to, to get a sense of. Um, of course, the most uh, common one is, is a game drive. Where, sorry, uh, a game drive, and that's actually a great way to see animals. The animals, and you have these special converted safari vehicles. Many of them have a rooftop hatch where you can, like you see on this picture, uh, you know, have a 360 view. Many have like open sided, so you can, you're very close to the, to the wildlife, which is exciting if you have a lion walking one meter, two meters from your car, and it's, it's very open, uh, you will definitely ask yourself, how do I know he's not gonna jump in the car? They never do, I can assure you that. But if you're the first time there, you will definitely ask yourself that question. Game drive is great because the animals are used to vehicles, so um, they will let you come close. Like I just said, you know, lion might just walk a minute, uh, a meter away from you. Um, last year, when I was in the Mara, we, we stopped on the road and right by the road, there was a, a tree and there were like two uh, uh, a, a cheetah, which are brothers. And they, they were just, uh, you know, lounging under the tree. And then we were just looking at them. We were five to 10 meters away. And then one of them got up, you know, showcase kind of stretches. And then he just walked slowly towards our car and literally lay down under our car, just sort of halfway in the shade, it was just uh, using the shade of the car. So for some time we couldn't continue driving. So they're, they're, the animals are really used to cars. They feel comfortable with them. So we'll see them really up close. So all of you will definitely, if you go on safari, experience that. But then there are other ways to experience a safari. A great way of walking safari, especially if you like the outdoors, there's something magical of going like eye to eye with animals. If you've seen your hundredth giraffe from a, from, from a vehicle, you will only be mildly interested in your hundred and first giraffe. But if you see that hundred and first giraffe on foot and you, your guide tells you, let's try to walk towards the giraffe against the wind that they don't they smell you and you try to get close, that's exciting. Yeah? And then you, you feel you're really uh, on par with them. You can sense that here in this picture, you have to have really good guides to 
um, you know, have that uh, sense of, of uh, you know, confidence to walk up to, to an animal like a buffalo. So we would, the, the camps we work with have extremely good and well-trained guides. And it's exciting to, to, to have this experience, especially if you've been on safaris many times. And you also see the small wonders of, of, of the world. You know, you might walk, and I remember one situation um, where we were just on a walking safari over the savannah. Suddenly the guide said to me, uh, or to us, just stop, there's a war going on here. And we said, what do you mean? And we said, look down. And we looked down and we saw there was like lots of ants moving around. He said, there's a war going on between termites and ants. And then we looked close and we could actually see, you know, uh, there's, there's um, big ants here in Africa and termites are much smaller. So we could actually see that there are many uh, termites on each ant, like grabbing onto each lag and they were fighting with each other. And I don't remember who won, but it was literally a war going on there, battle going on. And these are the small things that you will never see from a vehicle. Uh, you can see the, the footprints of the animals. And, uh, you know, of course, they will explain to you how they use the plants uh, and so on. So you get a different perspective of, of nature there. Another great way of experiencing safaris on horseback. For those of you who love horse riding, it's an amazing way to uh, be on safari. The reason is many animals do not uh, differentiate between a horse and a horse with a human being on it. So if you are upright and you're on a walking safari, you can be sure that the animals at some point will run away from you. And they might have like, a, you know, give you about 50 meters and then they will go away. They will just uh, move, move off. With horses, on horseback, you can actually have been five meters close to zebra and, and, and giraffe because many of them, they just see the shape of a horse and they feel comfortable with this because it's another animal. And, and so you get actually really close uh, to, to the wildlife. And there's not many places where you can do that, but especially for those of you who love horse riding, uh, try it out in Africa. It's an amazing experience. If you, especially if you're there during the migration season, a balloon safari is an amazing experience. It's amazing all year round because you see the dramatic landscapes of East Africa from the air, but especially during migration season, you will get a, you know, uh, uh, an aerial view of these huge herds. Often you can't even get a sense of how big they are. You know, as far as the eye can see, you will have these animals and from the air, you can see them. So especially, you know, the, the balloon normally starts early in the morning with sunrise and then it, it just, it's, it's an incredible sense of just floating. Sometimes it goes just over the tree line. Sometimes it goes very high. They regulate it and you, you might see, you know, a lion below you or elephants below you, these herds of, of wildebeest and zebra. And uh, so it, it's just an incredible sense of tranquility to float uh, over the African savanna, savanna. And then I talked about cultural encounters. This is a picture that I took some years ago and you can sense a little bit the joy of meeting uh, each other. You know, these are two kids and of course, many of you will have been traveling around the world and you know, wherever you go, kids will always be excited about uh, a traveler. They all come to you, they'll be curious but there's no, it's not no different in Africa. And, you know, often, you know, they will take pictures, uh, you'll show them, they'll be so excited. We strongly encourage guests not to give any, any gifts, whatever nature, rather give it to the local teacher. Otherwise you will uh, unintentionally turn the kids into beggars. Of course you don't want to, but they will associate a white person with someone who gives something. So the next white person, they will ask for whatever you gave. If you gave them a pen, they will ask the next white person for a pen if you gave some sweets, they will ask the next person for some sweets. But if you give the teacher the same, they can use it in, 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 in a good way. You might visit a school. Many of the lodges have local projects that you can support and will be able to, to guide you if you're interested in that. So cultural encounters uh, are really uh, often what many of our guests, even if that wasn't a main interest of them, they came to see the wildlife and they loved the wildlife, but when they, when they come back and say, you know, it really touched us, was you know, to interact with the local people. Um, one thing that not, may not be clear to everyone is um, um, wildlife uh, safari is actually great for families. I have a five-year-old daughter. I made a mistake. I took her on safari when she was three. She had about 10 minutes uh, attention span. She went into the national park, said, I want to see a lion. Uh, we saw a giraffe. She was very excited. Um, after 10 minutes, she lost all interest in animals. She discovered the the lipstick of her mother and started to paint the car red. 
uh, I think half an hour into the game drive, we saw a line. She couldn't be less interested in the line. So I would recommend if you have kids, you know, wait until they're, they're five or six years old. But then a safari is a wonderful experience. We have many guests who do, uh, you know, three, you know, generational travel where you have grandparents, parents, and kids. And I mean, you can see it here. You can, many of the guides, especially trained to, uh, you know, to do games with kids, to show them the little wonders of nature, you know, uh, the footprints, let them guess what the footprints are, you know, make, make fire here. The next picture, I think, brings it alive in a wonderful way, you know, just, uh, you know, imagine your kids just, you know, roaming around this golden savanna in Africa. It's a really, really beautiful, beautiful experience, and the guides are very much trained to make sure that it's safe. So I would say of all destinations around the world that we offer, and, you know, Enchanting offers more than 70 destinations, 70 countries, I'd say Africa, and particularly East Africa, is probably the, the, the most rewarding family destination because you, you experience things kids, all kids dream about wildlife, right? And, you know, uh, Lion King is where, 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 you know, Kenya is where Lion King was, was shot. So you will see some of the places where Lion King was shot. So these are the different things you can do on safari, but then there are also the moments that you may not even have in mind when you plan a safari that turn out maybe the most memorable moment. And that might be you waking up in the morning, someone knocking on your door or on your tent and saying, good morning. And they will bring the, the evening before they asked you, what would you like in the morning? And then they bring you a cup, you know, a coffee or a tea or a hot chocolate with some cookies. And then you sit in front of your tent and you see and you hear Africa waking up. It might be dawn, so still like half light. And then you often you might have the sunset in front of you, see the golden light on the, on the horizon. You hear all the sounds of nature. The birds make an incredible symphony in the morning. Uh, then you might hear other animals, uh, whatever is around. And it's, it gives, I, I, these are my favorite moments, just early morning, you know you have a safari ahead, you're excited about it, but now you just sit there and you, and you, and you feel and you see and all your senses are so awake as, as Africa around you uh, wakes up. So that's a fantastic start of the day. I don't think you'll ever have a coffee that tastes as good as when you sit there. And then you go on safari and you know, depending on where you are, you may be able to do a, more, a bush breakfast. An amazing experience. Just imagine somewhere in the savannah, you have a, you have a, a table set, a little a buffet there, uh, delicious food. They often cook it right there. And you might just have a herd of elephant or giraffe walk past you, you know, uh, never close that you, that you would feel uncomfortable. They always, you know, the animals make sure that they keep a distance. But that, you know, you will probably never have a breakfast that, that tastes as good as, as there. And it might not always be so elaborate. This is a picture from last year from my last visit to the Mara. This is on the Mara River, you can see it here. In this case, the, the guy just turned the bonnet of the car into our breakfast table. Uh, and you see, you know, we had delicious juice and, you know, freshly cooked bread and some quiche and, you know, sausages. And, and you know, again, that's probably the, 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 the best tasting coffee that I had all last year because behind me was the Mara River and there were uh, uh, hippos there, there were crocodiles there, you could see, giraffes walking on the other side, you were just part of nature. And it's those moments that really uh, are probably ingrained in your heart that you will take back, back home. As the day then moves on, um, at some point towards the end of the day is another favorite part of a safari experience. It's the sundowners. So at some point, um, you, you, your guide will make sure that you find a nice spot with a nice view and it might be a, a fire prepared, whatever, there might be a, a bar set up for you. And then just imagine sitting there with this golden light and, and just the incredible views. You might have a vantage point, uh, you know, a, a, an open view. The views in all East Africa, because you have the Rift Valley dramatic landscapes, you always have spectacular views. It's open, wide vistas. So these are the, again, moments that, that you know, tear at your heartstrings that, you know, you will probably never forget. And, and from our experience, we, we offer trips everywhere in the world, all continents, but there's no place in the world where we have as many repeat visitors as in Africa. And one of the reasons I think are these moments where you just sit in, in, in awe of nature. If you believe in God, this is the place where you probably feel you know, the, 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 the miracle of creation around you. 
and and you just feel wow wow and um and uh, another thing that is really awesome about safari is you never know what happens next uh, the the movie out of africa um you know which was shot as i mentioned partly in this house um that's one of the scenes where meryl streep as robert redford who takes it to the masai mara um, what is going to happen tomorrow and robert redford says i have no clue i have i don't know and that's part of the beauty of safari you never know what you're going to see the next moment you don't know you come around a corner and you don't know what you're going to see there might be a lion there and an elephant there there might be um just you just realize that there's there's a leopard hunting there you know if you see uh, a natural a historic monument you see it today you come back tomorrow the light might be different but it's the same monument whereas on safari it's always different can come to the Masai Mara like I said I've been probably 30 40 times to the Mara it's always different it never gets boring there um, so and but you have to have experienced it and then at the end of the day you might then crown your day with something like this just a bush dinner imagine just this you know just a dinner an open fire or these lanterns around you and then you have this incredible African sky um, above you and you might have your favorite drink and uh, and and at that point you just feel all is well yeah you know that all all worries of the of the world are are light years away when you when you are in that situation and I've experienced that many times so I can tell you from first hand experience you know all the worries of of the world probably most uh, almost all worries will just fade away when you just in in this moment so this is just the kind of experiences you can have when you're on safari I wanted to touch on what are the kind of um, accommodation where you can stay. Um, because it is, for someone who's not been to Africa, it's, it's not obvious what are the kind of places you talk about, you hurry about safari lodges, safari camps, what are they? So I want to uh, give you a sense of what are the different types of accommodation you can have. Um, so an overview of, of uh, uh, these, let me start with the, uh, what we call a semi-permanent camp. Uh, which is really spe special to the Serengeti. And you will understand it because I explained how the migration moves. And if you, if you have a permanent camp in one location, you will only be able to see the migration from that place for a certain period of the year. So what um, really people have come up with, they have come up with these mobile camps that stay two, three months at one place, and they move on to the next place. And that way you have a good chance of seeing the migration just outside your tent. So this is actually, you see a scene here of the migration just moving past uh, one of these camps. Uh, these are tented camps, but it's not a tent as we know it. It's, you can see the inside here, it's canvas, but you see inside you have a, a proper bed, you have a proper bathroom. Um, you will have what you call, what we call a safari shower. You'll probably uh, appreciate that if a camp moves every two, three months, you can't put plumbing in there because it will move. Um, so what what you what people have come up with is this ingenious construction here, where you have just a big bucket, um, and you fill 20 30 liters of hot water, and then you 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 put it down. You can see it here. Often you have outdoor showers, and then you 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 will let the water down. You will just make yourself like wet, and then you'll you know soap yourself in. You'll stop the water because otherwise it will will, will run out soon, and then you you know you you wash yourself off. You need a moment to get used to it, but once you get used to it, you can always ask for more water if you want to. It's just an incredible sense of being out there in the wild, still have a, a proper hot shower and, and have the stars uh, above you. So that's a, a, a typical semi-permanent safari camp. Uh, you see often breakfast is out, uh, just outside in the savannah. Sundown are often as well outside. Um, and then another type of accommodation that's what we would call a boutique safari lodge which are small very personally run lodges maybe with 10 20 30 rooms so not a big hotel you still have a very personalized experience the difference here is it's permanent in one place which means you often might have like a, a deck like you can see here vantage point you have will have plumbing there so you will have a you know a shower with you know as much water as you want um, so this would be for many guests who might not quite want it as adventurous, maybe a slightly more comfortable choice, but you may not be as close to the migration as in this uh, semi-permanent camp. And you can see those camps can actually be very comfortable. This is another example in the Masai Mara. Often you feel they're very homely, 
It's like a living room in the bush here uh, and really comfortable beds. You, you won't ever sleep as good as on safari because your days are long. You start very early in the morning and you do an early morning game drive, then you have a siesta and then you have an afternoon evening game drive. So your days are quite long and active and you will sleep uh, you know, very, very deeply Often there's going to be a, a hot water bottle uh, in the bed, which is nice because many of the safari places here are quite high, 1800 meters. So you will be, it gets fresh at night, so you'll be happy to have a hot water bottle in your tent. Uh, you have often bush breakfasts here. Um, you know, another example of a, of a, a safari lodge, which you can see is very comfortable, um, might sometimes even have a pool. Uh, so, so there are different types, different sizes. And we will, depending on what, what your preferences are, we can always suggest the, the, the perfect camp or lodge for you. This is the last one I want to share with you, the last type of accommodation. It's a luxury tented camp. So that's a level up from these uh, uh, safari lodges. It's just the ultimate in, in luxury. You might have like really just, a, you still be under, under canvas, but you have like a, a chalet or a suite with incredible views, with uh, you know, very tasteful decoration with fantastic service, amazing food, great locations, fantastic guides. Um, you might have, uh, this is an example of, of a camp in Northern Serengeti. Uh, you might have your own bathtub here with a view. Uh, you might have even, you know, a, a beautiful pool. Um, so there, you know, there, you can really be out in the wild and still have all the luxury you want. There's some camps that even have um, uh, air conditioning, if that is important for you, even though it's quite frankly, not that important here in the Serengeti, in the Maasai Mara, because you're quite high. It will never get, you know, really, really hot there. Even you're almost on the equator. So this is a sense of what are the kind of accommodation you can choose. So you really don't have to rough it when you, when you go to Africa. You can have the luxury and still this incredible beauty of nature and wildlife. The last thing that I want to address is, um, oh, this is my favorite camp. I forgot about this. This is in the Masai Mara Naboisho camp. You can go right on a walking safari. I've seen lions on a walk just uh, five, 10 minutes away from this camp. You see it's like a living room in the bush, incredibly tasteful designer tents. So uh, there's really hardly anyone who would not feel in awe staying in this place. And you, you, you know, especially uh, in the morning, evening would sit here and then the, the animals will just walk past you. Many of these camps will don't have any fences. So the, the animals walk past, um, you will be well protected. If you move around in darkness, there'll always be someone who guides you at daylight, uh, you'll be fine. But it's an incredible sense of being so close to nature, yet having all this comfort, which is really unique to our Africa. The last thing I want to share with you is uh, the question, where else can you go? If you come all the way from, uh, from, from North America to Africa, uh, to see the migration, of course, you, you'll probably want to see something else as well. So what could this be? And let's start with Tanzania, where the, the Serengeti is. What could you combine the, Tanz uh, the Serengeti with? Um, Tarangira is on the way to the Serengeti. It's a beautiful national park. Um, it has huge herds of elephants. That's the main draw. And then you have these, these uh, ancient baobab trees here. So very striking landscapes, especially uh, after the rainy season, very lush. There's a swamp there lots of wildlife, different habitats than the Serengeti. Then many of you will probably heard of Ngorongoro Crater, which is feels like Garden Eden because it's so open. You have this 21 mile um, diameter crater and inside all the animals that you could ever think of. You, you, you sit at a, you stand at a vantage point, you'll see the giraffe here, the wildebeest there, the hyena in the background, the uh, giraffe passing by, there might be some elephants walking there, the lion, you feel like you're in Garden Eden there because it's all, it looks so peaceful. Of course, the reality is, you know, there's still a, a food chain there, but often you will, I mean, lions 18 hours per day, they just lie there and sleep. You will often, in Gorongoro Crater, you often feel actually this is Garden Eden here. And if you want to then relax after the safari, you have the East African coast. Of course, in the US, you have the Caribbean, you have many beautiful beaches right at your doorstep, but it's only a, a one, two hour flight from, from the safari and you're at the Indian Ocean coast, beautiful turquoise water, you know, white sandy beaches. Uh, so some of our guests say, let us just relax uh, before we move on. Uh, back back home. And of course, you can do many other things. This is just 
uh, a snapshot of what you could combine the Serengeti with. If you are in uh, Kenya and you, you uh, have seen the Masai Mara, again, there are many options of places you can combine it with. The most famous is Amboseli. This is really where you have these iconic images of uh, elephants or giraffe in front of Kilimanjaro, the highest mountain in Africa, which is most year round snow, snow covered. There's still glaciers, even though they're uh, retreating. Uh, so this is really these iconic images. That's in Amboseli, um, great wildlife there. Then you have Samburu in Northern Kenya, very different landscapes, very arid, uh, one uh, river going through and you have huge elephant herds. Yeah? And they're, they're different there. They are red because the soil is red. Um, Often you see those elephants cross the river. There's, it's great for, for lion and, and leopards as well. And, and completely different to the Masai Mara. In the Masai Mara, this lush grassy plains, here you have striking landscapes, very arid landscapes. And then lastly, if you've been uh, to our, on safari many times and you want to see something more off the beaten path, there's really nothing better than Laikipia. Laikipia is in central Kenya. It has many private game reserves and it's a very exclusive and diverse safari experience. This is um, uh, uh, like you have many striking places. We have sundowners, like you can see on this picture, you can do walking safaris, horse riding there, you can do balloon safaris there as well. And, and you have uh, often a much more exclusive experience than in the national park. So for someone who has been on safari multiple times, like Kipia will probably still uh, uh, make you uh, 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 feel, wow, this is something I haven't experienced yet. And of course, again, in Kenya, you have the Indian Ocean Coast, for those of you who want to have a couple of days um, of, of relaxation at the end. And at the beginning or end of your journey, many of you may pass through Nairobi because if you are in Kenya, that is your entry and exit point. There's not really any way around Nairobi. And this is uh, then an option. If you're coming to a Nairobi, I would be very happy to host you at my house. This is the house from the outside. You can see the inside here again. This is uh, where uh, Meryl Streep uh, told stories to Robert Redford. Outside, many scenes in the movie were shot here. There's the, the, the veranda here where, um, you know, Meryl Streep surprises Robert Redford with a gramophone. Uh, many scenes are, are just out here. And we sometimes host our guests for, for a breakfast with a view of the sun of the Ngong Hills. Or if you come in the evening, um, we would have dinner just here at the table where I'm sitting right now. So um, I very much enjoy hosting our guests. Uh, uh, many of our guests are world travelers, so they always have exciting stories. So I, 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 I very much enjoy meeting our guests. And uh, if there's an opportunity, uh, that would be a unique experience that, that we'd be happy to, to offer you. So this is really what I wanted to share with you. And with that, um, I wanted to open up for questions. I can see there's some questions coming up. Uh, but before I do this, I wanted to ask you which of the destinations that I've now kind of hopefully brought to life to you are destinations that uh, you now feel, wow, I would like to visit that. I just give you a moment to, um, to, 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 to reflect and share. I'd love to see uh, which of the destinations really um, made, made you feel like, oh yeah, I would like to experience that. Yeah, not surprisingly, the Masai Mara, of course, a lot in the Serengeti. Um, I'm just waiting. Like Kipia, many of you seem to, uh, that Ngorongu crater comes out high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see, I'll give you one more moment. Yeah, of course the Masai Mara and the Serengeti. Interestingly, Masai Mara seems to be beating the Serengeti tonight. Um, and then Gorongoro crater comes out very high. And uh, yeah, Amboseli, many of you probably have these iconic images of, of Kilimanjaro and the, and the elephants in front of this. Uh, really a stunning view. So yeah, I mean, we would love to, to help you plan your trip. And with that, uh, you may have questions and let me just open up here my, my chat screen and um, uh, address the questions that you have raised. Let me see, um, Judith, you are asking, um, so you know, you're just telling us about your last trips in Uganda and Madagascar, and you've been to Isaac Dennison's house many times. Um, Oh, you're working with Lisa, that's great to hear. Just, I want to clarify, this is actually not the house where Isaac Dennison or um, uh, Karen Brixen live. This is the house where the movie was shot. Uh, the, the house where she lived is just 10 minutes from here. It's a uh, same style house. This was built in 1910. When the movie was shot in 1985, the, the actual house where she lived 
uh, was a government office and the government didn't want to vacate it. So the, 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 the Hollywood uh, movie makers were looking for an alternative house and they found this house. And, and 15 years ago, coincidentally, I, I moved in here. So just to clarify, this is not actually the house where she lived, but the, where the movie was made. Um, I can see there's someone asking, uh, what about bugs? Um, it's actually not as bad as you might think, uh, um, because many of the safari places are quite high. Nairobi is at 1800 meters. I don't have a mosquito net on my bed here because it's really too cold for mosquitoes here. Uh, the same the Masai Mara, Serengeti, even um, uh, even Gorongoro Crater and Laikipa, they're all above 1800 meters. So you will actually not, this is not a, um, a, a breeding ground for mosquitoes or malaria. Um, if you go to the coast, it would be different because there it's you know, hot and humid, but the bugs aren't all that bad. And in and, and all the safari camps where you might have bugs, they will have mosquito nets or you know, the tent will close well. So never really come up uh, as a major or as any issue at all by, by our guests. Yeah? Um, there's a question of if the wild bees are continuously on the move, how do we plan a vacation month in advance to watch the Great Migration Master Mara Serengeti? Good question, but you know, as I said, you can predict roughly where they will be. So January to March, they will be in the Southern Serengeti. Uh, you know, come March, you know, they might start already moving on to the Central Serengeti. So if you want to be on the safe side, go in January, February. Same with the, you know, the crossings in the Masai Mara. From mid-July, I've been here now for 15 years, actually living in, in Kenya. You can be sure, I don't think there was a single year where in mid-July they hadn't reached the Mara River. There was not a single year where they left before mid-late September. You know, if you come in October, you might be lucky or they might have already left. And it's often rain dependent. If you have a year with a lot of rain, can imagine there's more grass growing. So the animals will stay longer and they will move slower. If you have a dry year, then they will move on faster. And of course, that's something you can't predict. But if you want to see, especially in my mind, the most spectacular time of the year to see the migration is when they cross the Mara River. And you can quite predictably say from mid-July to mid-September, you will see that in the Northern Serengeti and in the Masai Mara. Um, you will not see it every day. The crossings don't happen every day, but they happen over a period of uh, two, three months. And they might, they, you know, the rains on the other side of the river, the animals cross over because they know there's fresh grass there. Now it happens, so the, the rains on this side of the river, they move back. So it's a constant back and forth, back and forth. Maybe not every day, but if you stay two, three nights there, you have a high chance of seeing it. Um, uh, there's a question from Sue. Can you talk about the Maasai? Uh, that's a very wide question. Uh, Ju, Sue, can you just be a bit more specific with your question? I will park it for a moment. I don't want to just go into a long monologue about the Maasai and not even address your question. So if you can be a bit more specific, then I'll be happy to address that. In the meantime, uh, how long do, there's a question from Peggy. How long do they stay at the river crossings to watch. Um, so I don't know if you mean for how many months or for lo how long uh, at a given day, <coughs> really depends. As I said, I mean, for two months minimum, you can see them from mid-July to mid-September. Sometimes it goes into, into October. I've even seen the migration in the Master Mara in November. You know, that was an exception. But if you really want to be on the safe side, so mid-July to mid late September, you can be pretty certain you see them. In terms of how long on a given day, it really depends. Sometimes you have a herd of wildebeest come to the river and then they spend hours just, you know, agonizing, should we, should we not, should we, should we not, moving left, moving right. They can't decide. Sometimes they just go, come to the river and immediately they cross. It's impossible to predict, yeah. Um, what about safety, Janet, is, uh, you're asking, specifically poachers, don't worry at all. We, in, 15 years now of, of uh, doing um, Africa's forest. We never had any um, a poaching incident that involved gas. Of course, there is poaching, uh, but you know, poachers will make sure they will stay clear from tourists. You know, poachers typically come at night and in most of these places, especially in the national parks, night game drives are not allowed. I mentioned that even if you're doing, if you're in a private conservancy, typically your limit is around eight o'clock and then you're supposed to be in camp. That gives you two hours, one and a half, two hours to see uh, wildlife at night, uh, see the nocturnal animals. But then in most places, they want you back in camp so that they know anyone who's out there afterwards might be a suspicious character. So don't worry about poachers. We've never had any incident 
there. Let me just scroll down. Um, uh, there's a question, depending on the COVID virus, will you help get any tests to leave the country? Of course. So we have, uh, what I would recommend right now is um, spend your last day in a, in a city, if you're in Tanzania, that would be uh, in Dar es Salaam or in Arusha in Northern Tanzania, you can do COVID tests there. If it's in, in Kenya, in Nairobi, Nairobi, I've done it multiple times. I live here, I've been in Europe, I think four times in the last year, and I always needed a COVID test. It takes 12 hours to get a COVID test, max 24 hours. If you come on the afternoon of your last day on safari, you fly to Nairobi, you go straight to a lab. There are good labs here. There are good hospitals in Nairobi. You do a COVID test. You don't have to wait at all. Five minutes, you're done. And then uh, you, you spend the last evening in Nairobi. Do, there are several things you can do in Nairobi. Um, and then by, by noon the next day, you have your test result. And the, the flights are all out in the evening. So you will, you will get your evening flight out. Um, you can even, if you don't want to spend the night in Nairobi, we have done that. We've sent nurses on into the safari uh, uh, areas. We've had nurses into, into the Masai Mara who just fly there. You are in camp. They take, you know, they take the sample, they fly back to Nairobi. And again, by, by the next day, when you're coming from the Masai Mara, wherever your last stop is, to Nairobi, you have your test. It, it costs a bit more because obviously now you're paying for the flight for someone. That costs maybe $300 for the flight. Other than that, it's not a, a huge, huge cost. Uh, if you're four people, it's probably another $70, $80 per, per person. Um, hope that addresses uh, your, your question, Peggy. Uh, Paula, you're asking what's the situation like in the areas you're referring to. Um, Kenya has currently growing uh, cases, uh, but not nearly at the level of Europe and or the US or other parts of the world. Um, of course, there is also less testing, I should say, here in Kenya, um, but there is no health crisis like you have in other parts of the world. Um, and I should also highlight um, a safari is probably the most socially distanced type of trip you can possibly do. Because you, you currently there's so few travelers, you'll probably have your own safari vehicle. You'll, you know, there's probably few people in the camps that you'll get the best service ever because everyone is focusing on you. you the, the tables are widely distanced. Um, you'll have private transfers. The planes are typically not full. I feel actually generally quite safe on international planes because they are empty. Uh, and then you know everyone who's on this plane had a, had a COVID test. If I go to a local supermarket in Germany, in my home country, uh, I'll probably get closer to, to the next chopper and they haven't been COVID tested. So I think the risk of catching uh, COVID in my local supermarket in Germany is probably higher than in a plane to Africa because everyone, like I said, you have distance, typically you'll have a row to yourself, maybe even a row before behind uh, free. That's my experiences uh, so far. And, and then, like I said, everyone on that plane, in order to even be allowed on the plane, has a COVID test. Uh, so, and, and a recent COVID test, probably just one or two days old. So the likelihood of meeting someone who is positive there is much smaller, I think, than, than in everyday life in wherever, wherever you live. Okay, um, let me see some more questions. Uh, oh, so now you specified your question on the Maasai, um, where you asked, where can you meet them? How do they feel about tourists? Um, so generally, as you can imagine, the more you get away from the tourist path, the more authentic the experience will be. Um, you can, if you drive to the Tungorongoro crater to the Serengeti, there will be villages on the side of the road, but these are like tourist villages where you know hundreds of vehicles pass every day, and then you will jump out of your vehicle. Some they will you'll do, they give you a tour of the of the village. They will try to sell you something. They will dance for you. That's the kind of experience that we are trying to avoid because it feels very contrived, very staged. What we much prefer are these private conservancies around the Mara, and you have that in other parts of Tanzania as well, uh, which is more of the beaten path um, where you might have the staff of the lodge who come from this village. And you might be the only person that day or maybe even that week who goes to the village. And because your guide takes you there and it's his village and it's his kids, you will feel much more uh, like being part of it and it's not staged. You just, and for me personally, the best experience are just when you observe what is happening, you can maybe get it introduced to the kids, you can maybe play, get a tea in the, in the, in the hut, but then you go. And, and um, I think at that point, the, the Maasai, which are, who are very proud, they are, they are very proud people. So they're very happy, I think, to introduce you to their culture if you come with, uh, with respect and uh, uh, to them. And so we are trying to 
to facilitate those kind of encounters away from the um, main tourist path where you have much more of a, an authentic glimpse. There are places where you can go on walking safaris with them, like Kipi is a great place. There are several safari lodges that are run by the local Maasai. And you just, you can actually do walking safaris with them and get a fantastic glimpse at their life. You might just walk past the village on, on that, on your walk and you, whenever ever any tourist comes. So there are many opportunities. If that is your interest, you know, talk to our travel consultant. They will be able to point you, depending on your other interest, the best place that can fit into your itinerary. Um, then my, uh, there's a question, what's the cost of mid-level accommodation for 10 days in, in, in Kenya? So mid-level accommodation days, you're probably looking if you're if you're sharing a room with your uh, travel partner or single rooms are very expensive. You know the lodge itself in depends on high season, low season. Right now you also have a lot of special offers. Probably a, a mid range accommodation. What I was sharing earlier, I would probably cost around uh, three four hundred dollars per person per night. That includes all the food, often the drinks, all the activities, and the guiding. So walking, if it's possible, game drives the vehicles to do it. Um, then you have park fees who are a major cost driver. Just to give you an idea, um, to uh, go into Gorongoro Crater, you're paying $80 park fees. Then to go into the, every vehicle that goes in pays another $300. Uh, so if you're two people going in a vehicle, you'll be paying $460 for one day, just park fees into Gorongoro Crater. So uh, East Africa, park fees are a major driver of cost. And then of course, there is some cost of moving around. If you fly from A to B, uh, if you move with a vehicle, uh, you could probably budget another two, $300 per day. So you will end up in shoulder low season, probably something like five, $600 on, on day on safari. If you're at the beach or in a city, it will be much less, but day on safari will be five, $600. If you're going to a luxury camp, it can easily be double that or even more. The sky really is, is the limit. Um, there's a question on how long do the vehicles stay at a time? I'm not sure I understand this question, Peggy. If you could please clarify this. Um, and then there's a question, is there a website for prior conservancies? There are. So um, you can actually, um, uh, likekeepia.org. Likekeepia.org is a great website. All the private conservancies in in Laikipia, that's only the area in central Kenya. They're typically regional. If you are interested in, in, in particular areas, because they're private conservancies all over Africa, not just East Africa, um, you know, we'd be happy to point you in the in the right direction. There are there are websites, but not one that has all of them. They would be more regionally focused. Since we talked about Laikipia, that that would be one. Um, I uh, Peggy, if you're still there, there's a question on the how long do the vehicles stay? I think other than that, we have, I've addressed all the questions. I hope I haven't skipped any. Um, uh, okay, that's Peggy, you're clarifying this now. Uh, the, 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 the river crossings, do you stay five minutes or stay for a while? You can stay the whole day. I mean, that's the beauty of safari. If you do it in a tailor-made way, like with us, you're not sharing a vehicle with other guests. I mean, often if you fly from A to B, you might share vehicles with other um, guests of the lodges, but then the lodge manager um, will make sure that you have similar interests. The worst thing that can ever happen to you is if you want to see lions and you're sitting in the vehicle with a guest who wants to see birds, because they will be looking with, through the binoculars at something that you will never see and you will get so bored and they might get bored at you wanting to see lions. So, but, but the lodge managers will make sure that guests with similar interests share vehicles and at current times, there's a good chance you'll have your private vehicle because there are so few guests right now. And so it's entirely up to you. So if you're going to the, Peggy, if you're going to the river, you might just say, I want to stay the whole day here. And, and the guide will say, fine. And the, the lodge, they will ask you, do you want to go for the whole day? Do you want to go for the morning and then come back? If you want to go for the whole day, they will give you a, a bush breakfast, a packed lunch. Uh, of course, you have to be back by dinner time because you can't stay out at night, but you can essentially every day, you can design as you wish. You want to have an early morning start, be out the whole day. If you want to sleep in, start later, just do an early morning drive and then rest at the camp. It's entirely your choice. And that's one of the beautiful things on Safari. You don't have to plan. You know, every evening the, at dinner, the, the lodge manager or your guide will come around and say, what would you like to do tomorrow? And then you, you will say, okay, what would you like to do tomorrow? Today we did this, oh, let's try this. They will make suggestions. And that's one of the beautiful things on Safari. Typically it's all prepaid. 
So none of this will cost extra unless you want to do a, a, a balloon safari, that would be an extra charge. Um, uh, but, but all the other things are, are included. And, and so you have this menu of things you can do and it's, the choice is really yours. Um, the, Michael, you're asking how many people are in a, in a group. Like I said, you know, if you, if you book this trip with us, you're the only ones. Yeah, um, of what could be if you can, there's two types of moving around. If you're going, for example, to the Serengeti, there's a good chance that you, you go to Ngorongoro, Crete and Tarangiri, you will actually have your own vehicle uh, because the, the parks are in driving distance from each other. It doesn't make sense to fly from A to B to C there. Whereas if you're in Kenya, uh, the road distances are longer and the roads are very rough. We would recommend that you fly there uh, because otherwise you might just spend six, eight, 10 hours driving, whereas the flight is a scenic flight, beautiful because the landscapes are so stunning, of an hour. So in that case, you would fly from A to B and then you would use the, the vehicles of the lodges. The, the maximum size of the vehicles would be six guests and they would basically have the driver and they would have three rows of seats and in each of the, uh, each row would have three seats, but they would only have two of them used. So that means Everyone who is in the in the vehicle will have kind of a window seat in the, the middle seat is free. Um, so you'd be maximum six people. Current reality is good chance you'll you'll have it to yourself. But you'll never be more than six people on a safari. So it's not a huge group. If you if you go with a, a tour operator that does group trips, it might be different. Then you might actually be in, in larger groups. But with us, never more than six people, very likely you're the only one. All right. I feel like I've never spoken so fast as this because there was so much to cover and, uh, and so many questions, which really excites me. I would say, let's call it a day. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope uh, to see you someday in, in Africa. And if you, if you have questions, reach out to us. Here's my email address, Florian Keller at EnchantingTravels.com. You might already be in touch with one of our travel consultants, our Africa specialist. Um, I look forward to welcoming you in, in Africa. It's, Really right now, it's an amazing time to come here because no one is here. You will experience Africa like you wouldn't have in 20, 30 years. Um, and if you come to Kenya and you have half a day to spend the morning on an evening, I would love to host you. I love meeting our guests and you know, hearing their stories, sharing my stories and you know, be a virtual traveler uh, together with our guests around the world. With that, thank you very much for your time. I hope You've, you're taking something away from this and yeah, thank you for spending this time uh, today with me. Have a good day and uh, be safe. Bye-bye.